I am finally back. Um, I was ill for a little bit and then we went on vacation. So I wasn't near my computer, but today we will finish chapter 12 of Let the Circle Be Unbroken. So here we go. When everyone had, well, okay. When everyone had gone and Christmas Day came to a close, little man Christopher John and I were sent off to bed. Susanna came to bed too and fell right to sleep after the long day, but I lay restless on my pallet, unable to sleep. As always, Stacy was on my mind, but finding it too painful to think of him, I forced my thoughts from him and thought of Miss Leanne instead. If she had her way, she was going to try to register, and I hoped she would. I felt right proud of her. I had heard enough to know that it would be tough, even dangerous, for her to attempt it, and I trembled at all I had heard. But then, I thought about all those afternoons Miss Leanne and I had spent reading together, studying the Constitution. I thought of what she had said about her father voting and how he had been beaten because of it. I thought about what Mr. Jameson had said about jurors, jurors being selected from the list of people who could vote. I thought about T.J. I made up my mind. Leaving the pallet, I crossed over to the door and went into Mom and Papa's room, where the adults still sat before the low-burning fire. They looked up at my entrance, and Mama said, Cassie, what are you doing up? I've been thinking. Oh? Been thinking about Miss Leanne and her going to register. I want to go with her. Mama glanced at Papa, then back at me. Why, Cassie? I frowned, trying to think of the best way to say what I was feeling. Well, I figure me and Miss Leanne, we been in this Constitution reading business together since she got them books of hers. And she done told me about her papa and all and how powerful much she want to vote. Well, I just figure I ought to be going with her. I hesitated and added. Besides, I'm kind of interested in the law and all. Big Mom muttered something I could not hear and shook her head. Everyone else was silent, looking at me. Finally, Papa said, Cassie Sugar, that's right admirable, your way of thinking. But what Miss Leanne is about to do is a dangerous thing. Your mama and me, we don't even know if we going yet. Well, Papa, you decide on going. Can I go? Papa rubbed his hand over his head, taking several moments before he answered. That's going to call for some serious thinking, Cassie. Yes, sir. Best now you be getting on back to bed. I said good night again and went into my room, but I didn't go to my pallet. Instead, I curled up in the rocker in front of the bedroom fireplace and listened to the talk on the other side of the wall. Y'all ain't gonna give no thought to this, are you? Uncle Hammer said before I was even settled. It'd be crazy for any of us to go in pure foolishness to take Cassie. Lord, just the thought of what could happen, Big Ma said, gives me pure fright. I know, said Mama softly. Still? Still what? questioned Uncle Hammer. You just heard Mr. Morrison here telling us about that lynching up around Tupelo just a year before he came here, and that was about some Negro trying to vote. This whole idea is crazy and it'll just end in trouble. Maybe. But you know how smart Cass is. Thing, this thing she's wanting to do, it could be something she needs to see. Mary, Big Ma exclaimed, you ain't thinking. I don't know, Mama. David, 
I just got a feeling I'm just as scared as anybody about walking up to that registrar's office talking about voting. But I've got this feeling. Cassie's seen so much, learned so much about what it means to be black in these past few years. She's nearly witnessed a lynching. She's seen a boy sentenced to death. This thing Miss Leanne wants to do, it's foolish perhaps, but it's something to be proud of too. If Cassie witnessed it, it could just mean a lot to her one day. Lord, Big Mom mumbled. David, what you got to say about all this? Uncle Hammer demanded. Papa let out a troubled sigh, but didn't answer right away. When he did speak, I leaned forward anxiously, waiting to hear. About Miss Leanne going to register, there ain't nothing I can do about that. About any of us going? I'm going to have to think on it, though. And about Cassie? There was a long silence. I don't know yet, Hema, Papa said at last. Right now, I just don't know. On the third day after Christmas, a car pulled into the driveway. And, unexpectedly, Cousin Bud stepped out led by Mama. We rushed outside to greet him, and a few minutes later, he was seated in front of the fire with Suzella across from him. Suzella seemed glad enough to see her father, but she was very quiet, watching him, waiting as if she knew why he had come. David home? Cousin Bud asked, turning to Mama. Mr. Morrison? They went over to Smellings Creek on some business. Hammer's with them. They should be back shortly. Cousin Bud looked uneasy. You say Hammer's here? Well, then I won't be staying. You know, him and me, we don't much see eye to eye. Don't worry about Hammer, Mama said. Cousin Bud smiled and somewhat embarrassed. Somewhat embarrassed. Then we started taking a talking of all that had happened in our lives. He shook his head sadly as we talked about Stacy and looked at me in genuine concern as he learned more about my illness. For more than an hour he sat by the fire with us. Then suddenly he stood, saying that he wanted to stretch his legs after the long drive and asked Mama to go walk him with him. Mama looked a, li a bit puzzled when he did not extend the invitation to Cizella. After all, Cousin Bud had not seen his daughter in more than six months. All right, Bud, she said, and the two of them went out. When Mama returned alone, Suzella seemed not at all surprised to learn that Cousin Bud was not waiting, was waiting to talk to her on down by the pond. She simply nodded, put on her coat, and went out. Then Mama told us why Cousin Bud had come. He and Suzella's mother were getting to a divorce, and Cousin Bud was here to take Suzella home. Christopher John Littleman and I stared at Mama and said nothing. Suzella had come to mean a lot to Christopher John and Little Man, and at that moment I realized she had come to mean a lot to me, too. Since Stacy had gone, I hadn't even thought about her leaving. When they going, Big Ma quietly asked. Big M Bud wanted to leave tonight because of Hammer being here, but I talked him into staying until tomorrow. I figure Suzella needs at least that much time to pack and say goodbye to folks. Outside, we heard a call, car pull into the drive, and Christopher John said, Pop and them's back. Big Ma got up and walked slowly across the room. Spect I'd best get them dresses Suzella done washed and ironing up for her for I start supper. She stopped at the dining room door and looked around. Lord, I'm sure gonna miss that child. Sure is. Then she turned and went into the kitchen. A short while later, Suzella was packing. You know, I don't really want to go, she said as she pulled her dresses from the chiffonier. 
This seems much more like home now than New York. She looked around the room and was thoughtful. I folded a sweater for her and carefully placed it in the suitcase. I'm sorry about your folks, about them getting a divorce and all. Suzella shook her head. I'm not. Not really. I knew it was coming. Which one you gonna stay with? She didn't look at me. My mother. I didn't say anything. She glanced at me, her look somewhat guilty, and continued to pack. It'll be easier for me, Cassie, if I stay with my mother. I guess, I shrugged. You want to be white so bad. Cassie, please don't start that. I sighed. I wish you could stay. Thought you couldn't wait for me to leave, she laughed. Well, you kind of grew on me. You kind of grew on me, too. All of you. I only wish she didn't finish. What? Noisily, she wrapped a shoe in a newspaper to cover the cracking of her voice. That Stacy had gotten back before I left. She stopped and met my eyes. When he comes back again, give him a big hug for me and tell him, tell him I really missed him. I handed her the other shoe. I promise, I said, looking away. Then, feeling a new loneliness at the thought of her leaving, too, I went around the bed and hugged her tightly, something I had thought I would never do. The, when everything was packed, we joined Christopher John and little man sitting on the front porch. Suzella, ain't there no way you can stay? said Christopher John. You heard mama, I said sullenly. She can't stay. I know, he admitted, but I wish I could. Little man looked around at her. We gon' miss you, Suzella, he said, and quickly looked away again. Suzella bit her lower lip and wiped at her eyes. Then she stooped down between them and put her an arm around each one. I'll be back, though, she promised. Stacy and I will both be back. Christopher John rubbed the back of his hand across his nose and nodded to the road. Truck coming, he announced in a husky voice. A few moments later, a truck turned into the driveway. Mr. Tate Sutton and Charlie Sims got out. Jeremy was with them. Christopher John hopped up immediately and ran inside. Papa, there's some white men out here, he said. By the time Mr. Sutton, Mr. Sims, and Jeremy got to the steps, Papa and Uncle Hammer were on the porch. Christopher John slipped back out behind them. Jeremy nodded at us, and Mr. Sutton said, David Hammer? Papa and Uncle Hammer nodded their greeting. An awkward silence followed. Then Mr. Hussutton, who obviously had been elected to do the talking, spoke up. I suppose y'all done heard the union's getting started up again. Union? Papa said, as if he had never heard the word. Mr. Sutton nodded. That's right. One more sweeler got started. Papa was silent. Silent, feigning ignorance. Uncle Hammer stood several feet behind him, leaning against the house, allowing Papa to do the talking. One, I, one got ended when Morris Wheeler got burnt out. They say he's back, by the way. You had heard that, hadn't you? I can't say that I have. You just don't nothing, know nothing now, do you? said Mr. Sims, a sour look on his face. Jeremy shot his father a disapproving glance. Mr. Sutton rushed on, not giving Papa time to answer. Well, we come now, cause we know things are only gonna get worse. Can't figure on nothing much getting better after what happened over at the Walker place yesterday. Maybe he don't know about that neither, interrupted Mr. Sims with a sarcastic snarl. Mr. Sutton looked irritably over his shoulder at Mr. Sims, then returned his attention to Papa. The walkers putting twelve of their families off the land, white and colored. Mostly white. Say they can't make no money with a quarter of the land fallow. Say the families have to go for the weeks out. We figure the walkers can do that. Then so can Mr. Granger, Mr. Montier, Mr. Harrison, anybody. 
So some of us been talking and we figure it's time to get the union back on its feet. He paused, looking embarrassed. Come to, cause we figure maybe Mr. Wheeler was right about colored farmers. About colored farmers being a part of it. I see, Papa said. Hope you do, said Mr. Sutton. You get the colored in on this thing and we can get to moving with it. Do some standing up for ourselves. Keep this kind of thing from happening to the rest of us. Papa stood in silence. Mr. Sutton and Mr. Sims and Jeremy waited. Then Papa said, I expect y'all want to get the union going then. You best talk to the folks sharecropping on plantation land. We figures to do that, said Mr. Sutton, but we also figured Mr. Wheeler's most likely started with you, best we do the same. Papa did not confirm having ever spoken to Mr. Wheeler, and Mr. Sutton did not press him about it. But he did try to get Papa to commit himself to talking to other black farmers in the community. Papa, however, committed himself to nothing, including ever having even heard of the union. Finally, Mr. Sutton gave up and started away. We gotta have us a meeting come another week, he said in a parting attempt to gain Papa's alliance. You remember that. Come on, Tate, Mr. Sims ordered brusquely. I never did like the idea of begging old near. Mr. Sutton shook his head and walked back to the car with Mr. Sims following. Jeremy turned to go with them, then stopped and looked back at us. Any word? he asked. I shook my head. No word. Jeremy's lips parted as if he wanted to say more, but he left without speaking again, probably not even realizing his eyes had said it all. Uncle Hammer and Papa watched the truck pull away, then went back into the house. A few minutes later, Cousin Bud came out and said that if Suzella still wanted to say goodbye to Mrs. Leanne, then we had, been, we had better get started. Christopher John Littleman and I decided to go with them. At Miss Leanne's, Russell said, You know, I was kind of planning on trying to get you to talk to me a little bit. He teased a smile from Suzella. Afraid I don't have no chocolates, though. You don't need any. You encouraging me, then? Suzella seemed embarrassed. Where's Wardell? I was hoping I'd get a chance to see him. No telling, but I'll tell him you said goodbye. I didn't really get to know him. Few people do. But I like him. I'm glad. By the way, Cassie, Russell said, turning my way, tell your folks that if they decide to go on into Strawberry with Mama, Mama Lee next week, then we'd be obliged to go with them. Cousin Paige won't let us take the wagon. Cousin Leora says she'll be going and I'll be going. Y'all don't go? Then tell your papa I'll be speaking to him about borrowing the wagon. All right, I said. Well, here we is, announced Miss Leanne proudly as she stepped back from her cabinets where she had been searching the last several minutes. We had a jar, she had a jar in each hand. Got some pickled beets for you and some crackling. Wants y'all to have some of these here pickled cucumbers, onions, and tomato preserves too. Y'all liked them so much. Suzella smiled and shook her head, speechless. Russell nudged her. Ain't she something? Oh, yes, Suzella agreed, looking into his eyes. Something mighty fine. For a moment, their eyes were fixed on each other. Then Russell said, You want to see Wardell before you go? I got an idea where he went off to. You won't. We can go check. Suzella glanced over at Cousin Bud, engaged in a hearty conversation with Miss Leanne, and got up. Half an hour later, when Cousin Bud decided it was time to go and Suzella and Russell hadn't come back, I was sent to get them. As I ran outside, I call, saw them coming up the trail from the little Rosalie. I was about to call out to them when, to my surprise, Russell turned Suzella to him and kissed her. Suzella allowed the kiss. Then, looking confused, pulled from him and ran back to the house. 
Cousin Bud said he's ready to go, I told her as she hurried past me. Hardly looking at me, she nodded and went inside. A few minutes later, when we were in the car and going down the trail, I whispered, I seen Russell kiss you. Susiella glanced at me a bit embarrassed. It didn't mean anything. I stared at her. Really, she protested. You say so, I said, letting her have her way about it. As we pulled into the road, we saw Dubé Cross come up ahead, and Cousin Bud offered him a ride. Dubé hopped gratefully into the back seat with Suzella and me. He was headed over to the Harrison Plantation. I told him about the visit from Mr. Sutton and Mr. Sims and what they had said about Mr. Wheeler's being back. Dubé, however, claimed he didn't know anything about Morris Wheeler. I, I, I ain't seen him, he said earnestly enough. Though I had my doubts about the truthfulness of his statement. That they here, they must be, be hiding. You sure you ain't seen him, I questioned. Thought y'all was so close. I, I, I just helped him out s sometime. I, he stopped and stared out the window. Uh-oh, there that steward. Coming toward the crossroads from the north was Joe Billy Montier's car. We could see two other men in the car and figured they were Stuart Walker and Pearson Wells. Cousin Bud slowed, then turned onto the Granger Road. I kept my eyes on Joe Billy's car as it picked up speed. I didn't like the feel of it. Bill, Joe Billy honked at us and Cousin Bud slowed down. Don't, I said, don't stop. Cousin Bud looked in the rearview mirror at the car. I ain't gonna stop. Think they just want to pass. Joe Billy's car was now at our tail. Cousin Bud pulled over to let them pass. They pulled along beside us. Say, boy, Stuart hollered from the front passenger seat. Pull over a second. We want to talk to you. Please, Cousin Bud, don't, I said. I got me a feeling. Them boys, they up to no good. Dubé, you tell him. C Cassie, she most like it right. Better speed on up. Cousin Bud glanced over at Stuart. It's probably nothing. I don't make any make it anything. I'd better stop. He slowed to a stop and nagging remembrance told me he was wrong. Dreadfully wrong. Joe Billy stopped as well and Stuart Pearson Wells and Stuart and Pearson Wells got out. Pearson walked around to the other side of the car, put his foot on the front bumper. Stuart came over to Cousin Bud's window and peeped inside. His eyes rested on Suzella. Say, Suzella, he said, I hear your father's here. This him? Suzella blanched and nodded. Stuart stepped back from the car. Well, well, so this is the boy who sired a pretty thing like you. Cousin Bud gripped the wheel and stared straight ahead. He don't look quite light enough to me. Stuart looked over at Joe Billy then Pearson. What about y'all? Not that I can see, Pearson replied. Joe Billy did not answer. Stuart laughed. You know, this gal of yours, she pulled a pretty good one on me a while back. Had me thinking she was white. Had me bowing and scraping to her like she was a lady. Yeah, I won't be forgetting that. His eyes settled on Suzella, lingering too long. She crimsoned as he stared, but did not look away. Finally, Stuart stepped back and motioned Cousin Bud out of the car. Get on out and let's take a look at you. Uh, Joe Billy stepped from his car and came closer. Cousin Bud, his hand still gripping the wheel, looked over his shoulder at Suzella. Move, boy, snapped Pearson. Cousin Bud released the wheel and got out. Dubé opened his door to get out as well, but Pearson stopped him. You, boy, you stay put now. Stuart circled Cousin Bud to inspect him. Don't look no lighter out here to me than he did inside, he decided. Maybe it's the sun got him so dark, suggested Pearson. 
Probably he's real light skinned under that fine suit he got on. Maybe he just need to take that off. Maybe so, Stuart agreed. Please, said Cousin Bud, my daughter. Now, that's just what we're trying to find out about your daughter. Why she looks so much like she white? Can you tell us why? Cousin Bud, as chilly as it was, began to sweat. Well, what you say, boy? Her mother, she, she's real light-skinned. Yeah, now that's just what we heard. In fact, she's so light, she's white. Now, what you say about that? You been betting a white woman? No, sir, I... It's a colored girl, Suzella's mother. Well, I hear it, Stuart continued. Up in New York, they lies most anything. Even niggas wedding white women. You hear that too, Pierce? Pearson nodded. Yep, heard that too. Stuart turned back to Cousin Bud. You hear that, boy? Cousin Bud swallowed hard. His eyes cast to the ground. Tell me, you ever sleep with a white woman? Stuart taunted. Ever want to, huh? Bet you did. Don't be scared. You can tell me. You white trash, leave him alone. There was a moment when nothing moved and nothing was said. Then slowly, Stuart turned and stared in silence at Suzella. I waited, unable to breathe. Finally, very quietly, Stuart said, You might look like you white gal, but you best remember you ain't. You vex me today, and I'm going to take you out of that car, too. Suzella met his gaze and did not look away. Don't you hurt him. I mean that. Don't you hurt him. Her voice was calm, yet threatening, and Stuart seemed not to know how to react to it. He started toward her. Joe Billy moved forward quickly and grabbed his arm. Oh, come on now, Stuart. This done gone far enough now. I say what we ought to do is make the nigger strip, said Pearson. Suzella leaned forward to protest, but Cousin Bud hissed sharply. Hush, Suzella, hush. Stuart took a deep breath and pulled his arm from Joe Billy's grasp. He kept his eyes on Suzella a moment longer, then turned to Cousin Bud. That's an idea, Pearson. We'll just see how light the nigger is. All right, nigger, go ahead. Get them clothes off. Cousin Bud looked stunned. Please, sirs, don't make me do that. My daughter, the children. But look here, can't you see it's for your own good? You lied as you claim you are under all that clothing. We'll, be, we'll have to believe what you say about that gal's mama. Go on now, do, long, do like yon told. Stuart, for God's sake, objected Joe Billy. He'll catch his death cold out here. Stuart turned on him angrily. You just shut your mouth, Joe Billy. You ain't got the stomach for this. Then get back in the car. As for me, I'm going to find out about this nigger. You heard me, boy. Get them clothes off. Cousin Bud's whole body trembled. Please, he pleaded. Not in front of my daughter. Stuart's hand lashed out and struck Cousin Bud across the face. Oh, God, Suzella cried and opened the door. Before she could get out, Joe Billy slammed it shut. Stay there, he ordered. Dubé leapt from the other side of the car. Please, M Mr. Stewart, he... He didn't finish. Pearson punched him hard in the stomach and Dubé fell to his knees. Dubé, we cried from the car. Stunned, we gazed on as Pearson grabbed Dubé and, pulling him up, slung him hard against the hood and twisted his left arm back to hold him. Blood spurted from Dubé's nose, and I felt the knot of fear tighten within me. All right, Stuart said to Cousin Bud. I'm waiting. Get them clothes off. Trembling, Cousin Bud took off his tie. 
Bet you strip a whole lot faster than that when you got some gal waiting for you, he laughed obscenely. He laughed obscenely. Cousin Bud glanced around at Suzella, then took off his coat, then his shirt. Get that undershirt off, Cousin Bud, Bud complied. Stuart again walked around him as if examining a prime steer. What you think, Pierce? Pearson struggled. Still can't tell. I think we better see his legs. Stuart nodded. You heard him, boy. Take off them pants. Please, just let me go down in the woods there. Get him off. Cousin Bud did as he was told. He stood there, his back to us, his body shaking, with only his shorts left to cover him. I looked away, feeling his humiliation. What you say now, nigger? taunted Stuart. You ever sleep with a white woman in New York? You know what we do down here to a nigger tries that, don't you? Cousin Bud lowered his head and stared at the ground. Stuart grabbed his chin and jerked it upward. Wants the truth now. This gal's mama white. Suddenly, before I could stop him, little man flung open the door and leapt from the car. Skirting Pearson, he dashed madly up the war road toward the wagon, which had just appeared on the rise. Mr. Morrison was driving it. Joe Billy stared at the wagon and turned back to his car. We better go, Stuart laughed. Just cause some nu just cause of some nigger in a wagon? If I ain't mistaken, that ain't no ordinary, ordinary nigger. That's the one bo folks say broke Dewberry Wallace's back and put Thurston's arm in the sling. The wagon drew closer. Mr. Morrison, his eyes sure and steady, took in the scene. A few feet from us, he stopped and pulled little man up beside him. Then he nodded toward Pearson. Be obliged you let go of that boy. Pearson looked uncertain. Or you want I get down and I can try holding my arm. Pearson glanced over for Stuart's approval and getting no reaction released Dubé. Uncle, Stuart said, you messing in some, something you don't con Uncle, Stuart said, you messing in something don't concern you and I ain't gonna hold for it. Not from no, Mr. Rankin, get your clothes on. Nigger, look here now. That y'all's car there? Then it best be y'all get in it. And get on home. And let us do the same. Mr. Morrison's voice was soft and quiet as always. But the unspoken threat hung over the still forest. Joe Billy got in. Come on, Stuart, he said. Stuart stood in a rage, not moving as he glared up at Mr. Morrison. I said, come on. Stuart turned, then looked back again and pointed a finger at Mr. Morrison. I ain't gonna forget this. I ain't neither, said Mr. Morrison. There seemed nothing else to say. Stuart got in the car. Pearson followed him, slamming the back door angrily. Joe Billy turned the car around and drove off. Mr. Morrison waited until they could no longer be seen and spoke once again to Cousin Bud. Mr. Rankin. Put your clothes on, and we'll get on home. Cousin Bud nodded and reached for his clothes, but broken with fear, he retched upon them. Mr. Morrison got down from the wagon, and picking up the clothes, clothing, led Cousin Bud into the woods. Not knowing what to say, we said nothing while they were gone. In a few minutes, they came back. Daddy, you all right? asked Suzella, her face pale, her eyes filled with pain. Yeah, baby, I'm fine, Cousin Bud replied, getting into the car. But his hands shook violently as he reached for the ignition. M Mr. Rankin, I, I can drive. You want me to, said Dubay, holding the bottom of his shirt to his nose. He, he, he ain't hurt me n none. Without looking at him, Cousin Bud scooted over. Mr. Morrison, with little man beside him, turned the wagon around and headed home. Silently, we followed. Before the car rolled to a stop in the driveway, Cousin Bud got out and went to the outhouse. And when he finally came to the house, he would not look directly at anyone. That evening, before dusk, he and Suzella left for New York. And that is the end of Chapter 12.
makes me sad, the things that people do. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace.